today uh, we are mostly going to speak not about Hegel, uh, but about another topic uh, which uh, usually people call computational photography. And uh, just a small introduction about me. Uh, I'm a Hegel Grandmaster, previously uh, I was number four in the global ranking, but uh, uh, unfortunately I just uh, stopped my uh, say career in Hegel. Currently I don't solve uh, any competitions. Uh, totally I have eight gold medals, uh, all of them are in deeper competitions and uh, almost all of them are in uh, image processing. And uh, previously worked as a software developer in Yandex. Yandex is a Russian uh, search engine company. It's like uh, Baidu in uh, China. So we also have our local search engine. Uh, and uh, also work as a deep learning engineer at Samsung AI. And currently I'm a senior research engineer at Huawei uh, Technologies. I work in Moscow. And uh, my group is working on uh, image processing, uh, generally uh, for improving image quality of uh, camera in Huawei smartphones. So, during the workshop, please don't hesitate to uh, raise hands and ask uh, me some questions, and I will also ask you some questions. And the first one is here. So, what is computational photography? Does everybody know? No. Okay. So, computational photography, uh, this is a specific area, uh, not only uh, of deep learning, but actually of all computer vision. But uh, today, we are going to talk only about deep learning part. So, this is a, a digital image capture and processing techniques that use digital computation instead of optical processes. And uh, the reasonable question will be, so why do we need, why do we need process photos, not just by good uh, hardware, why do we need some computations there? So the answer is here. Look at this table. Uh, and here we compare the size of sensors uh, on different cameras. And uh, the size of the sensor is uh, very, very important because if your sensor is very small, it can not capture a lot of lights. So your image will be noisy and uh, uh, you, your camera will always work under the low light conditions. So this is the biggest problem, uh, the biggest problem uh, what we have when we uh, talk about smartphones, about cameras and smartphones, because unfortunately uh, the smartphone uh, is very small and uh, the sensor there is also should be small. So, uh, and that's why uh, we need to process our images captured by, uh, uh, by uh, phones, uh, not only by hardware, but apply some, uh, uh, some uh, algorithm as well. Uh, if we just uh, take some professional camera, which is, uh, it's called full frame matrix or even medium format, which is uh, a little bit uh, bigger, uh, the light of uh, the light which, which can capture the sensor, uh, there will be much more light. So uh, it means that uh, it will be much easier to take photos uh, during the night, uh, during uh, just like uh, you know, rainy days and, uh, and uh, in any uh, other conditions as well. Okay, the most popular problems in computational uh, photography here. So basically it's uh, uh, demosaicing. Uh, we will talk about uh, demosaicing uh, later and I will describe in details what it is. Uh, demosaicing, super resolution, uh, HDR, 
color enhancement, degrowing, decreasing, sharpness adjustment, automatic white balance, correctness adjustment, contrast adjustment, decompression, focus changing, for example, OK effect on the smartphone. And, uh, and also, uh, video uh, slow motion, video stabilization, and painting. And uh, uh, all of, all of uh, these products uh, can be solved uh, in different ways for images, for single images, and for videos. Because, you know, uh, when you capture a video, basically we have much more information about, uh, about objects in this video, right? Because uh, if our task is a super resolution, just to example the image and preserve some and, uh, and save some detail there, uh, from the video we can extract much, much more. But uh, how to do it? Actually, I can say that nobody knows. And uh, almost, uh, no, not almost, all of these problems are not solved yet. And uh, at the applications of computational photography, it's firstly, it's improving the quality of photo and video in smartphones. Secondly, it's uh, better uh, compression and decompression powers. Because uh, when uh, some users have a slow connection, for example, slow internet connection, we cannot uh, translate a uh, like 4K video, you know? because uh, it's like impossible. But if we apply some modern techniques for compression and decompression, uh, it can, it can uh, help a lot in this problem. And also, uh, another application is uh, restoration or, and uh, even colorization of uh, old photos and uh, videos as well, uh, which captures like uh, uh, 50 years ago, or even 100 years ago. So, and uh, as well, uh, some new features for camera, which uh, weren't present uh, before. So, these are these four applications, I think, uh, are the most important in computational photography. And this picture demonstrates a typical. Uh, we call it ISP pipeline. ISP is an uh, image signal processing. Uh, to be honest, uh, this pipeline is very, very simple. It just consists of uh, several general steps. The first one is, uh, of course, uh, capturing, capturing the lights uh, by, by the sensor. Uh, actually, it's an analog data. And then translating this data into the digital one, uh, but we don't worry about uh, about uh, these two parts, of course, because uh, we are not hardware engineers, right? We are uh, data scientists, and uh, all uh, other parts are our interests. So uh, the digital data which we uh, get at the input. It's actually the raw data. And uh, some techniques are required to convert it to the RGB space. And also, uh, there are uh, the, the very basic uh, four, uh, four blocks here are brightness, white balance, uh, sharpness, and uh, contrast adjustments. Uh, these uh, four blocks. So these five blocks, including the conversion from row to the RGB, uh, these five blocks are present, I can say, in any camera, not only in smartphones, uh, but uh, in uh, modern smartphones, the, the pipeline is much, much bigger, and there are actually uh, tens and dozens of, of blocks there and each block independently process uh, the image and uh, for, for, for its own purpose, like for, for image to noise or for image super resolution of the blurring. And uh, uh, this also uh, is a 
biggest challenge is how to combine these blocks, uh, right? Because uh, we should properly understand which block should be the first, which second, which the third. You can't, uh, you can't uh, just uh, try all the merits because you have a deadline for uh, for uh, for a new smartphone, and uh, we should just. Uh, some pipeline and release the smartphone. And what uh, will we have if uh, the pipeline is wrong? So uh, these challenges are still remaining and uh, we also struggle with them and uh, we also try to solve it. But uh, it's uh, quite difficult. So what is raw images? Uh, usually, raw images uh, look like this. Uh, the sensor, the incoming clients, uh, which, uh, which go to the sensor, are split using, uh, splitting using uh, three filters. A red filter, green filter, and the blue one. And, uh, and then, uh, all of, uh, all of these uh, all of the results are applied to just a one channel image. And here, if we just uh, take some four, uh, uh, some four pixels, we will see that uh, there actually uh, will always be two green ones, one blue and one red. So uh, the task here is to convert it to the uh, regular RGB image which has uh, three channels. And uh, so, do you know, does anyone know how, how we can do it? Some algorithms or some ideas. Basically, uh, the, the simplest algorithm is uh, very, very simple. No idea, okay. So, the simple algorithm is just the linear interpolation. Uh, we can uh, just take one, for example, red pixel and, uh, and see uh, the closest, the nearest uh, others red pixels and just uh, average them. So this will be uh, our uh, output. And uh, we can uh, also apply the same technique for uh, blue pixels and for the green ones. And uh, somehow it works. So. But there is a one, not actually one, one problem, there are many problems in the algorithm. But uh, there is uh, the biggest one. And uh, what is this? The biggest problem here is that uh, all colors are processing independently. So uh, the algorithm cannot capture some information. Uh, for example, when we compute in uh, the value of a red value uh, or, or red pixels, or red pixel, uh, the algorithm uh, doesn't uh, doesn't doesn't uh, see to, for example, like for the nearest green pixels or, or blue pixels, and uh, this is the biggest downside. And uh, and actually, uh, this algorithm. Uh, works uh, very bad, especially uh, when the, the image has a lot of like edges, and uh, near the edges uh, there are always or almost always the, the wrong color translation. And uh, other algorithms as well, uh, some kind of interpolation again uh, for each color independently. Uh, you can uh, use some, uh, some interpolation which you prefer, like the big cubic ones, line, and even luscious receptor. And um, uh, the modern, I say, algorithm, which I consider uh, also, uh, also the values of other colors, are special spectral divers and uh, also other classical algorithms. And uh, the current trend, 
uh, in computational photography is to use deep learning, uh, deep learning based approaches for this task. But uh, how to do it? Because uh, for deep learning approaches, you know, we always need the data. We need uh, something like query data here. And uh, how, how to collect this data? Uh, in a few words, uh, the simplest uh, way to do it is just uh, use the higher resolution image. Uh, then, uh, uh, I mean, rows are assessed, row of resolution image, then convert it to the RGB space just using some classical algorithm and uh, down sample it by like 16 times, and there will not be any artifacts there. So, uh, after this, uh, we can also down sample uh, the row image, uh, like, uh, like this one. Why not? This is just a regular image, uh, but it just also uh, just kind of has uh, one uh, one channel. But anyway, uh, we can down sample it. So, and this will be the X, like the input. Uh, I mean, the down sample, the raw image, and the down sample converts it an R to be image by classical algorithm will be uh, the target. Uh, well. Uh, actually, deep learning based approaches uh, somehow uh, work in this task, uh, but uh, they do not uh, significantly improve the results. Another, uh, another uh, very important problem is the image denoising. Because, as I said before, the sensor size in a smartphone camera is very, very small. So when, uh, when the sensor is small, the images will always uh, be noisy. And uh, the task is here is to uh, remove this noise while, uh, while save, uh, save details in the image. And the output image of our algorithm uh, of course, should uh, have, should have uh, the same content as the input, and, uh, and colors also should be the same. So this is a problem statement. And uh, again, for deep learning, uh, the first question will always: when we can get data for? Uh, image denoising task, there are two approaches. The first one is synthetic data generation. Uh, we can just use uh, some uh, uh, already, already good images uh, without, uh, without any noise and uh, just manually add uh, some Gaussian, Gaussian noise to the RGB images. And uh, this technique is somehow works. Uh, we will uh, see at the, the finish our workshop. We will uh, run the denoising model, which I actually trained, uh, trained uh, during my flight from the Moscow to Beijing, and uh, I just use uh, this technique for this. And uh, uh, also, uh, the training uh, approach is to uh, get the raw image as the input to the denoising algorithm because a raw image will always uh, will always uh, have much more information uh, right because all uh, pixels in the raw images uh, we can consider them independently and actually uh, if we uh, if we modulate if we modulate the, the noise uh, so uh, the noise, the, the mean uh, value of the noise uh, will be zero. So uh, having like four uh, four pixels, uh, we can estimate the noise level there and uh, try to remove it. And actually, there are some uh, uh, some uh, uh, real noise distribution which comes from the 
uh, from the, um, the uh, physics, from optics as well, and uh, it's like a theoretically proven because you know when we use just Gaussian noise, uh, this is just uh, uh, what data scientists uh, could do, yeah, right? Because uh, usually data scientists do not understand exactly uh, the real the real problem, not, not just the real problem, but uh, the physics of, uh, of the problem. And, uh, and actually for RGB images, <coughs> there are no any better ways to uh, synthetically generate uh, the noise. But also another approach is to uh, capture some real data. If we have uh, uh, some uh, specific equipment, like teapot and, uh, and also uh, professional camera and uh, we have some controlled environment like static scenes we can uh, just put our camera uh, onto the teapot and uh, capture many many uh, images of the same scene and then just for example average the pixels so the, uh, using uh, uh, several pictures, uh, when we arrange them, the noise uh, will just be removed, and uh, we will, uh, at the finish, we will see just uh, the noise picture. So and also we can uh, capture, uh, capture, just take one, uh, one of them. Uh, which we captured already, and use it at the input, and the average one at the target. So uh, this is how uh, real data collection techniques work usually. But uh, you know the problem here again that uh, we can collect it only uh, under the uh, controlled environment, usually it's in dual environment. Because if we go to just to the street and uh, put the camera there, there will, in most cases, uh, there will be some moving objects like uh, uh, trees, uh, uh, birds uh, as well, uh, and uh, many, many others. And it's very, very hard to, uh, to make uh, outdoor environment static. And, uh, and take uh, an individual there. So this is the uh, drawback of uh, such approach. And uh, um, of course, uh, I, I think you all know that uh, uh, neural networks uh, using just only endure uh, data will be biased. And, uh, they will not work as good uh, for outdoor data as they work for Indurva. And uh, this is the problem, actually. Okay, uh, suppose we already have data and uh, we have a pair data set just input images with noise and output without, without any noise. And now we are going to train some kind of uh, neural network. So, which model architecture should we use? The answer is very simple. We can use any, uh, any model which takes an image and outputs an image of the same size. So, uh, I think uh, there is no any difficulties here. And uh, what are example of such models? This is my question for you. Auto encoders, okay. Fully convolutional. Fully convolutional neural networks, yeah. Of course, I think that uh, some of you already tried to solve something like uh, image segmentation tasks, yes. Yeah? And uh, there is also uh, architecture which takes an image and output the image. So, why not using it? And uh, the answer is. Yes, we can. Of course, we can. Uh, for example, the simplest model, it's called DNCNM, is just uh, stacking 
of very simple blocks. The block uh, consists of one convolutional, one batch normalization, and uh, one renewal activation function. So the convolutional, uh, the convolutional layer uh, usually it's like something like uh, kernel size is equal to three and the volume is one, so it doesn't change the size of the image. So and in the end, CNN, I can say this is like the first, maybe the first work uh, in image denoising uh, with uh, neural networks. They just uh, use like 17 such blocks, uh, they just stack them, and uh, that's it. This is the architecture. So there are no uh, any just uh, hard, hard things there. And uh, actually, uh, there are many, many different architectures which work like image to image models. And in uh, computational photography, the model architecture is very, very important. Even if you use uh, very good, the best data that uh, you, uh, you have, uh, the model architecture will also uh, play, uh, say, uh, the importance, uh, the most important uh, role in the, in the algorithm. So it's uh, uh, very um, interesting because uh, in some tasks like, for example, image classification, uh, changing uh, the model structure a little bit usually will not drop, uh, will not significantly drop or change the performance. I mean the quality of predictions, but in computational photography. It's, uh, it, it works like this. So trying to apply uh, different architecture for, for a specific task is very important. And this is a picture just uh, of a unit model. Uh, I hope uh, uh, everyone already seen it at least one time. It's just a take an input image. And, uh, and uh, process it in several, uh, in several blocks and after each block it has uh, uh, maximum layer and also uh, there are residual connections from, uh, from uh, each block to the same block uh, on the right side so it's the models like uh, auto encoder but with the residual connection it's like a symmetric model and uh, uh, usually in uh, semantic segmentation tasks, um, this architecture can achieve something like state of the art. But in computational photography, usually it uh, doesn't work. Okay, let's move to the next task uh, called super resolution. The problem here. It's obvious, uh, we have a, a small image, uh, the image of a small size, and we want to upcycle it, just in grid resolution. And of course we have some requirements. First, a model should add some details to the image, because uh, when we just upcycle the image by some kind of classical algorithm, like uh, bilinear upcycle, for example, uh, it doesn't introduce new details uh, which uh, the high resolution image should have and also as a requirement that the output should be sharp and uh, the model shouldn't change uh, the content of the image and, uh, and of course the output image should look, uh, should look uh, real I mean uh, uh, for And then we try to upcycle it. 
and uh, see how uh, how they works. They are all uh, basically different, and uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, you previously uh, heard only about few of them. Me too. Uh, 
uh, interpolation for the real world images. So also, uh, another technique is to generate real data. How to do it? For example, uh, again, uh, in controlled environment, we can use two, two fixed cameras. Like uh, one of the camera will be a professional camera, which can produce high resolution images, and another one uh, will be the smartphone camera. And uh, we can take a picture of the same size of scene again. It's uh, not very easy actually. Uh, because uh, we have to align, uh, align the image pixel by pixel and uh, there are no uh, always ways to, to do it uh, but uh, when, uh, there are some heuristics which we can use for this and uh, uh, again the problem here is the same like in the noise task because Again, it's uh, very hard to collect a uh, diverse data set. We again cannot uh, capture uh, lots, of, lots of pictures uh, in outdoor environment. And uh, uh, we will again have some kind of bias uh, in our data set. And uh, there is no way how to remove it with such two approaches. But there are another ways uh, called uh, unsupervised image to image translations. Actually, uh, I didn't see any good result uh, yet. But uh, I know people, people work uh, on such approaches to, uh, to apply them for, for the computational photography tasks. And uh, uh, unsupervised image to image models, uh, their goal is to uh, find actually usually two functions. The first one function in our case uh, will take a high resolution image and somehow downsample. And the second one will uh, take a low resolution image and unsample it. And uh, <laughs> I once use neural networks as uh, these functions. So uh, again, the requirements here is that they should return realistic results and uh, do not change the content of the image. Okay, uh, I will just uh, I will just want to uh, describe uh, I think the most popular uh, unsupervised image to image translation approach which calls uh, CycleGen. Uh, basically, CycleGen uh, used uh, for style transfer tasks, but uh, why not consider our task as style transfer as well? Because uh, the style of uh, images taken with this, uh, from the smartphone and from the professional camera, the style is different. And why not to learn to translate the style? Uh, and uh, how, how cycle then approach works? Basically, it has uh, two, uh, two networks, uh, which called GAB and GBA. Uh, this is exactly uh, like uh, uh, these two uh, G and F functions which uh, introduced here. The first one is uh, take an image from domain A and try to uh, generate uh, the same image in domain B. And the second, uh, the second uh, generator uh, just take the image in domain B and try to generate the image in domain A. And also, uh, having such two networks, we can add some uh, interesting losses like uh, cycle consistency loss, which is uh, an true loss here. Because if we take, uh, if we randomly take one picture uh, from the domain A, translate it to the domain B, and then translate it back, we want to 
to expect the same image as we passed at the input. So we can just simply apply uh, parapixel loss here. But uh, it's just only parapixel loss, it will not work. And uh, there are also uh, another, uh, another loss function introduced, generates uh, adversarial loss. Uh, we have a discriminator uh, which learns to understand which picture is the real one and which is generated by our network. It took uh, a picture and uh, it just solved the binary classification problem. Just uh, it will be, uh, uh, it should output uh, once, one if the picture is the real one, and it should output uh, zero if the picture is the fake. So the goal of such discriminator is to discriminate uh, and it is to differentiate between uh, between uh, real images and fake ones. But uh, if the discriminator is a neural network. We can compute a gradient of such network and we can apply it as a loss function for, the, for our generator networks because our generator network wants uh, that the output of discriminator for fake images will be 1 by period. Right? So why not just uh, propagate through the, uh, through the discriminator? And this is uh, just basic uh, explanation of cyclogen approach. This is a very, very important and popular approach uh, which I used in uh, many, many tasks, not only in uh, computational photography, but also for, uh, for example, for, uh, for other uh, unsupervised and semi-supervised types, like in uh, image simulation, for example, and uh, I think it could be applied for just for anything. Okay, but uh, let's suppose we have a good player data set, which we uh, take as the real one, and uh, we was able to uh, to collect some data both on indoor and outdoor environments, and uh, the data set is very very good. And we also have a very stable and very good model architecture, which takes uh, an image input and the the output one. So the next thing we should define is the loss function. So what kind of loss functions could we use here? For the first idea, uh, as I said, we have a pair data set. So we can just use any parametric loss. So why not use uh, in squared here, like, like any two rows? And the, the answer is simple. We can we can use MC here, but it will not work. Why? Right. Try to work this time. Because if you encourage um, blurry results. Yeah, but why the results will be good? Restore the ground truth, and uh, the NSE uh, 
doesn't consider uh, like pairs or group of pixels. It just looks, uh, just uh, takes uh, one pixel of the predicted image and one uh, of the target, and just uh, measure the square tier between them. Another answer is that there are many possible outputs which can be produced from the same input low resolution images, and all such outputs will be uh, will look good for I mean for uh, for human eye. Uh, and uh, this exactly uh, these are exactly the main two problems. So there is just no one optimal solution. There, there are many of them. And uh, some interesting findings. Uh, as E loss uh, always, always in any uh, computational photography tasks, always leads to blurry images. It doesn't preserve current. Uh, but uh, another, uh, for example, loss function, which calls uh, mean uh, average, uh, mean absolute here, like L1 loss, usually works much, much better than the MSC1. But still, it's not perfect. It's again a per pixel loss, and it's again uh, struggling uh, uh, with the same two problems which I described before. Okay, uh, so the loss function should be like something like a distance between two images, between the predicted one and between the target one. Are there any uh, other ways to compute the distance? Okay. 
having just one additional network, which we call discriminator, it takes, uh, it, it will be just like standard uh, binary classification model. And the goal of the discriminator is to take two images, not, not actually two, it's just take one image. Uh, and uh, the answer of the discriminator, the target, the output, uh, and the, either the image is a uh, real one or generated by our uh, network. So it calls such images as fake. So uh, because the discriminator is a neural network, we can backward through it. Right? And uh, to make our generator better, we want that the output of the discriminator for fake images should be like, real. So a discriminator should not understand where are the real images and where are the fake ones. This is exactly what our generator wants. So, and uh, let's just use uh, the adversarial loss described uh, find here. We just uh, uh, take our low resolution image as the input, put it to the generator, which produces a high resolution one, then put it to the discriminator, and we expect that the output should be uh, close to, uh, to 1. And for example, we can use MSU loss. Yeah, this is not, uh, this definition is not like usual for adversarial loss in hypnosis. Usually uh, there are some uh, like uh, sigmoid function, like uh, binary percent of the loss as well. Uh, but uh, in practice, uh, such simple approach is MC. It's called this uh, square scan. It works much better. Okay, and uh, uh, how to train uh, such two models? Uh, usually we train the discriminator and the generator at the same time. Just uh, like one gradient step for generator and just one for discriminator. And uh, adversarial loss. Uh, this technique is very, very useful for many applications in computational photography. Basically, when uh, our goal is to produce the uh, like, uh, real results, which uh, looks, looks very natural. Mm. And uh, in, uh, for example, in science, uh, super resolution task, uh, it makes the output image much sharper and it uh, just adds more, more details. But there are not actually some failed cases, a lot of failed cases. We are not considered them. And how to solve them? This is another biggest challenge. This is uh, just a picture which describes what I said before, like the okay, generator, discriminator, and the output of uh, the input your generator, uh, the data set <coughs> which we use for training to just the experimenter is very little just in the free class. And it just predicts the labels here, it's class, uh, one or zero, or just some probability of one. Okay, uh, let's move to uh, the start for a task which calls uh, color enhancement. Uh, the, the screen here is not very really actually good. It doesn't affect any colors. Just uh, do the, let me say, degradation of colors. So you, can, you cannot see a real picture here. So uh, the goal of the color enhancement uh, program is to just give an input image to make colors better. For example, it uh, should improve uh, some dark parts of the image, uh, improve correctness, and make the dynamic range uh, much more higher. Like from uh, LPR, it's a uh, like, uh, low dynamic range images, to HDR. Okay, and what will be the training date for color enhancement? Okay, there are again two, uh, two ways how to generate the first one is just using uh, good quality images to, uh, to degradate them by some 
kind of function. Usually it's just like some kind of tone mapping. And the second one, uh, again, uh, using two cameras, like we did in a uh, super resolution task, uh, takes photos of exactly the same things. Basically, in computation of photography, approaches of uh, collecting the data are very similar in, uh, even in different tasks. <coughs> so what are the positives and the negative sides of such synthetic data generation approach? I hope uh, you can answer this question because uh, you already uh, we already discussed it for for previous uh, tasks for denoising and for super resolution. And the answer is simple. Yes, we can generate a very big data set. But again, it's very hard to find a degradation function which will make images uh, close to, to the real ones which we capture by our uh, say, bad camera smartphone. So this is exactly the problem uh, which we want to solve in uh, all, uh, almost all of the tasks in uh, computational photography. And how to solve it? Any ideas? Uh, I think I, I already described my idea. So, the answer is apply similar approaches uh, for collecting real data from, from, from other uh, products. Okay, uh, let's just think that uh, we already understand how to train the models. Let's just think that we solved all the problems. The problems with data, the problems with loss functions, with the problems with architecture. And that's it. Okay, but how to measure the performance of the model? Any ideas? Actually, the answer is there is no way to do it. And uh, this is the biggest problem in computational photography. Because when you don't have a magic, you, you just I don't know what to optimize, right? So, uh, yeah, uh, we can consider uh, the approach when uh, we just estimate the perceptual quality by using assessors and uh, apply just our model on different images and show them to assessors and ask them to, uh, to, uh, to uh, estimate the quality. But it's very hard, again, to obtain a single number, just a single number which can describe the performance of our model. Because uh, when you have uh, many, many models uh, in such approach, uh, you should compare them just uh, one by one and see uh, and try to absorb them. Uh, but uh, it will require a lot of time, firstly. And secondly, it will cost uh, not just some money, it will cost big money. Right? Because, uh, for example, uh, in my uh, usual work, I just uh, conduct approximately eight or nine new experiments each day. So uh, I cannot spend the company's money to uh, to estimate the performance, because if we should uh, if we should compare the models pair by pair, mm -hmm. right, uh, increasing the number of models, we increase the uh, uh, how to say uh, the hardness of estimation just uh, by square, right? Because uh, comparing. Uh, model by model is uh, impossible here. But uh, usually people in uh, researchers in computational uh, photography uh, use two uh, metrics. Two metrics which can be computed uh, just automatically. 
The first one, called ES and R measure, is a quick signal to noise ratio. It just computes the first bit and the speed between the inputs, uh, between the predicted image and between the target one. Uh, then here, max, uh, max is usually is, uh, like the maximum value, the maximum possible value of the image, usually it's uh, like uh, 255, just a constant. And then uh, just apply this for this uh, So again, we already talked about tendency, uh, that uh, we cannot use it for a loss function, but here it's used for metric as well. So the problem here is similar, right? And the second one is uh, more uh, difficult to understand. It's uh, more smarter. It's called uh, s sims or structural similarity metric. Usually, uh, it's computed uh, between just two uh, windows uh, of uh, image uh, of the predicted image and of the ground truth image. And it takes two, two windows and uh, compute such formula for them. The mu x here is a mean value. Mu uh, here is a mean for 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 image, and uh, sigma <coughs> is a uh, just standard deviation, like a usual. And c1 and c2 some uh, some constants uh, which uh, define uh, like the metric and uh, they do not change. And uh, <laughs> the interesting uh, thing here that, uh, uh, as I said, we compute uh, structural similarity between two windows. And uh, how, how it's computed for the whole image? Actually, the whole image just split into all, <coughs> all the windows. Then uh, we can compute the same thing. And then, just for example, leverage. And uh, if you open uh, any uh, paper, for example, for super resolution, for the modding, uh, for color enhancements, it doesn't matter. You will see the numbers. You will see the, the same performance of, of their model. Uh, but uh, usually, no one says uh, which window size they used. And it's uh, impossible to understand from the paper, especially when the paper doesn't uh, have a source code. So this is just another interesting finding. Okay, uh, so, and this uh, map, the uh, SC metric, so, uh, it preserves actually the contours and some kind of edges uh, and general structure of the image, but uh, it doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, add some penalty for color change. And the PSNR is exactly for preserving the colors. But again, neither a scene nor PSNR correlates with the perceptual quality. And even if your model uh, has higher PSNR and a scene metric, it can be much, much worse. I mean, in terms of uh, human estimation, than another model with lower metrics. So, this is interesting. Okay, and uh, at the conclusion, uh, computational photography has a lot of challenges actually. It uh, uh, serving with all the parts which are required for the work, like with data, with the model architecture, with loss functions, and with the metrics. So, uh, if it's uh, cannot uh, just uh, uh, solve any of uh, these four problems. The question is how it works. Why? Why? Why it works? But, uh, I don't have an answer here. I think nobody, nobody has. And, uh, and actually, if we consider uh, these uh, four uh, challenges. The biggest one, in most cases, will be the data collection. Because if you don't have real data, it's very hard to synthetically generate something good. 
And uh, also, the interesting finding that uh, many, uh, many tasks, many problems in uh, computational photography are very similar to each other in terms of how, uh, how we solve them. So they uh, some, sometimes uh, have uh, the same or similar uh, loss function, the same similar model architecture, and the, the same metrics. Almost uh, always this scenario is still. Uh, the difference is only in data. And uh, yeah, and uh, as I said, uh, it's uh, <coughs> part of to measure performance and understand what should be optimized. Yeah. But uh, anyway, for the newest future, I expect that uh, this, in this area uh, we will see a very big progress because. Now, you know, it's like a, a mainstream to, uh, to, to use it in marketing that uh, in our new smartphone we have an artificial intelligence camera. So, come and buy it and uh, you will have like a professional camera in your, in your pocket, right? But uh, in practice, it doesn't uh, work in this way and in practice, uh, even now, uh, even the top uh, solutions, smartphones, uh, they are all have a lot of problems, especially when taking uh, pictures, I call it the videos, under the low condition, uh, low light conditions. So this is all about uh, presentation. If you have any question, it's time to ask them.
And this, this is why uh, modern smartphones uh, often and often introduce some things, some uh, things to the camera which works uh, based on deep learning approaches. So uh, I hope that uh, in the uh, near future the uh, influence speed on such mobile devices will be much, much better than, than, than now. And, uh, but you know, uh, even when you have uh, better hardware, your model will become anyway bigger than now. So uh, you will want to, to compress the bigger model than now, uh, as it goes uh, when we talk uh, just even, uh, about desktop uh, server GPUs. Right, because five years ago, all our models was were uh, very small compared to to, to those uh, which we have now. For example, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, VGG network it's actually not very small, right, uh, in terms of number of weights, number of parameters. But it's uh, just uh, 90 layers. It's not very really different. But uh, you know uh, the the name. Of the uh, of the paper which introduced the literature, the name of the paper is very deep neural network for image classification. But now it's uh, 90 layers. It's uh, not deep. It's uh, very small. <coughs> Seems like small. So uh, I hope I answered. Even if you already have 
and the three percent models, because uh, if you combine them in not in the right way, uh, the outputs will be uh, blurry or have uh, has some noise or something else, some artifacts. So uh, this is quite interesting to see how to combine uh, these uh, three networks into one. For example, some of them you can use uh, twice, right? For example, for color enhancement. If we just uh, take a picture and enhance the color uh, by the model, why not put it uh, to the color enhancement model again and try to enhance it even more? So, uh, and uh, you can do it not only two times, three, four, five, six, seven, I don't know. Yeah, it depends. And it's an interesting task how to construct the automatic pipeline. So uh, you can play, you can try to play with such, uh, uh, with such notebook. And uh, there are actually only four images uh, which, uh, which can be used for, like, for the validation of your approach. But uh, of course, you can just capture some image uh, using your own smartphone and uh, put it to your pipeline and see whether it improves it improve the quality or, or not. So I can also, uh, since I have a workshop, I can also uh, open this novel and show you how it works. Uh, uh, and see 
the output here of the whole pipeline, how it works for the, for the image. And, and there will also be the final evaluation for four images. And then it's not very hard to just put your own image here, like change on the, on the one line of code. So let's look. So this is a narrow, the result of a narrow center. So you see, there are a lot of artifacts here. Like here, here. And uh, and uh, for uh, for the denoiser, the noise image is now hard to estimate the the noise level, but uh, just also precise and see uh, the out. So. Input. The input is here. So let's just see, for example, for for uh, for this grass. Uh, I think it cannot be seen uh, on this display. But if you download uh, the notebook, it will actually be seen that the, uh, the noise here is uh, very high the noise level. But still, here is also. But let's try to change the parameters of the node, for example, one file. And we use one. And now, see the results. Yeah, it's uh, much better. And we also can apply the denoiser several times. But uh, the downside of uh, denoiser is that it uh, was trained, trained just using uh, L1 boss. And uh, it uh, blurs the output a little bit. So this why uh, we can uh, uh, we can apply our nearest uh, upward sorry our uh, near observer to the denoised image, uh, not just for the for the input one. Okay, let's try and uh, and see the results. So this is the result of just a regular uh, uh, neural sample. So there are a lot of artifacts here. I think we cannot deploy such a model to the real uh, production. But let's try to do much first. And uh, it requires some time. Actually, I don't have the GPU here. It's just uh, processing on the CPU, but the denoising and the power enhancement models are quite small and uh, they uh, work very fast even for high resolution image. But assembly isn't. and how to 
also combine them and uh, incorporate some uh, some tricks into the pipeline. So now you see that uh, uh, there is no such artifacts that, that we we had here, but uh, the image uh, became blurry, right? But uh, we already know how to uh, how to deal with blue image. For example, we can again downsample the image to the original resolution and again run uh, the near of absurd. So uh, this will be your homework. The answer is it will not work. Thank <laughs> you.